Last week we began a series of studies in 1 John, one of three little letters that the Apostle John wrote to the churches sometime around the end of the first century, probably between the years of 80 and 90 AD, and probably from the city of Ephesus. The church was continuing to spread rapidly across the known world, but at the same time she was facing significant challenges from Greek culture, which dominated the thinking of the Mediterranean area. And there were two embryonic errors which were beginning to cause problems. Gnosticism and Docetism. Gnosticism, which was a teaching that believed there were certain secret and mysterious things that you could know that if you possessed this knowledge, which is a gnosis, Gnostics, uh, that would bring you into a right relationship with God. It was a, a mental, uh, an intellectual salvation. As a consequence, they believed that the spiritual was good, but the physical was bad, was evil. So really, as long as you were mentally right with God, as long as your spirit was right, it didn't really much matter what you did with your body. And an offshoot of Gnosticism was Docetism. Believing that if the material was bad, then God could never have taken upon himself a human body. And if Jesus uh, appears to us as God, it's only uh, something that we seem to be true, but is not in reality truth. Docio means to see. And if Jesus took upon himself human flesh, he only did so for a limited time. And most certainly he did not take uh, human flesh to the cross to die for us. So John writes resolutely to oppose these sources of erroneous teaching. He writes to proclaim the wonders of the person of Jesus Christ. And he writes to protect the unity of the fellowship of God's people. And as we prepare to study God's word together, let's pause in a moment of prayer. Let us pray. Father God, as we turn to these ancient words, now almost 2,000 years old, may they speak to us with relevance for our daily living, for our love and service of you. May we understand the implications of this truth. And may we live it out by the strength you supply through the work of your Holy Spirit within us. Lord, may we live to love you and obey you, to walk in the light as you are in the light. To the glory of the name of Jesus Christ, we ask these things. Amen. Just three verses for our study in this session. Beginning to read at verse 5. This is the message we have heard from him and proclaim to you, that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him while we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. As John develops his themes in his writing, as I was explaining uh, last week, his, his style is very interwoven. At times you might even say tangled. Themes recur in verse after verse. His arguments do not flow in a linear fashion. Even so, I'm endeavouring to move through the text verse by verse. I had originally planned to do six verses, but three will be more than enough for us in this session. And as we study, let's be aware that each verse does not stand alone. You must always have the bigger picture in your mind as you grapple with the words of one particular verse or text. So beginning with verse 5, let me read it for you again. This is the message we have heard from him and proclaim to you, that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. So verse 5 is the big headline verse from which all the rest of this section will take its lead. To those who would claim to have some special insight, some secret or deeper knowledge of God, i.e. the Gnostics, John declares that the message he proclaims, the gospel he preaches and teaches, he has received firsthand from the lips 
of Jesus. Perhaps you've watched some police or legal dramas. And if you have, you'll have heard of what's known as the, the chain of custody. A careful record that is required to be meticulously kept to show the integrity of a piece of evidence. The chain of custody, into whose hands has this evidence been placed for a time? If that is questioned, then you may not be able to use that piece of evidence to be able to get a conviction in court. And John wants us to see the chain of custody for the gospel that he preaches. The evidence that he presents. It was first from Jesus that he heard these things and now with his pen he records them for us. He didn't make this up. He, he didn't get it from another questionable source. Note again, he has this idea of uh, the, the sensory. In verse 1 of chapter 1, he said, That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and touched with our hands, concerning the word of life. John really wants us to grasp this truth, that, that what we read from him, he has first heard from Jesus. He can say, I know because I was there. The Apostle Paul does something very different about the integrity of his gospel message. We, we read in Galatians 1 verse 12, he explains, For I did not receive it from any man, nor was I taught it, but I received it through a revelation of Jesus Christ. And how comforting it is for us to know that the scriptures are, are not something that men have just made up for themselves or plucked out of the air. That their source is directly from God. Now evidently, there were other new and fanciful ideas that were circulating among these recently established churches. Ideas that were supposed to be that the cutting edge of theological thinking. And John wanted nothing to do with these new Fangled teachings. He, he was like the old minister who was accused of being not, not with it. And who responded to the suggestion in verse by writing. You say that I'm not with it. My friend, I do not doubt it. But when I see what I'm not with, I'd rather be without it. And that's what John's saying. He's going to challenge these new, these contemporary and spurious doctrines that are leading to division and confusion in the church. And he's going to do this by going back to first principles. It's a fearful thought in uh, this month of June, but I remember exam questions, particularly those that I would have to answer in my studies as a civil engineer, that they would always begin something like this. They would say, derive from first principles the formula and use it to solve the following. And that's in, uh, in a sense a little bit like what John is saying to us here. The teaching that he wants us to apply is to be derived from first principles. And the major first principle is this. God is light. There's a sort of unwritten maxim that, that John has. That whoever knows Jesus must make him known. And John, having heard, is eager to proclaim. Just note how many times that idea of testifying or proclaiming appears in these opening verses of his letter. John has an important message that he wants to share with us, and it is this. God is light. Now elsewhere, in, in John 4 and 24, he will write, God is spirit. And later on in this letter, in 1 John 4, 16, he will write, God is love. And that's important for us to grasp that when it comes to the consideration of relationships within the body of Christ, the church, it's important for us to know that God is love so that we would live lives of love together. But when we have to understand the way in which we can rightly relate to God, it's essential for us to grasp this truth that God is light. Again, just in passing, I mentioned it last week, but we see throughout John's writings these three uh, major themes, light, life, and love. They recur over and over again. Indeed, in John's gospel, there is some variation of the word light used more than 40 times. 
very much central to his thinking. So John declares, expresses to us this truth, God is light. Many of you will know the catechism question and answer, question four, which asks, what is God? And then answers that God is a spread, infinite, eternal and unchangeable in his being, wisdom, power, holiness, justice, goodness and truth. And in that answer, there's a great deal of heavyweight theological information. It would take all eternity to unpack the truth contained. Fortunately, John has for us a simpler, uh, more easily grasped truth to learn about the nature of God. God is light. And he follows up that assertion with a restatement and reinforcement of the message, only this time he voices it negatively in him is no darkness at all. Now, right thinking about God is vitally important. If we want to live rightly for God, we need to think rightly of God. David Jackman in his commentary says, all sin is in essence an attack on the character of God. If our view and understanding of God is awry, then everything else follows on from that will be in a mess. Now, you know, you'll meet people and they'll say something like this. Oh, I like to think of God as. And then they'll go on to tell you about some image of gentle Jesus, meek and mild. that They have designed a God who is agreeable to them and tolerant of them, far removed from the truth of the great God we seek to worship. This passive and permissive caricature is not the God to whom we must give an account for our lives. John is the one who sat at the feet of Jesus, who could say of himself, I am the light of the world. John 8 and verse 12. Of him, John could write in, in First, uh, John chapter 1 verse 5, he said, the light shines in the darkness and the darkness has not overcome it. John says, God is light. There's not a hint of darkness about him, nor is there tolerance of darkness by him. And as he seeks to unpack and apply this great statement in the verses that will follow, we'll see three elements which are at the heart of the gospel message. And they are firstly that we see the holiness of God, God is light. Secondly, we see the sinfulness of man, that we are in the dark. And as a consequence, thirdly, we see our desperate need of a saviour. God is light. But John has told us that his purpose in writing is that we would have fellowship with the Apostle John and in so doing have fellowship with God the Father and his Son Jesus Christ. Look back up to verse 3. So there must be a way in which people who have loved darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil, John 3.19, 3, how these people can enter into fellowship with a God who dwells in unapproachable light, 1 Timothy 1.16. And the answer, gospel hope, is found in these verses that follow. So let's move ahead to consider verse 6. If we say we have fellowship with him while we walk in the darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. So here we have the first of three errors that John wants to unmask. We'll only study the first of these in this session. But each begins with a little phrase, at least it does in the ESV, if we say. And the presumption is that there were those making such claims, saying such things, and John wants to challenge that thinking and to say that because God is light, it simply cannot be so. And if we say these things, we are not speaking the truth because God is light. And the first suggestion here is that sin doesn't matter to God, that he's ever tolerant and always ready to forgive. He's something like a, a doting grandfather, unable to see a single fault in his grandchildren, no matter what they might get up to. But, as Paul writes to uh, the Corinthians, 2 Corinthians 6, 14, he asks the question, what fellowship has light with darkness? 
God who is light cannot be tolerant of those who live in the darkness. Now we must note that John here doesn't refer to a single sinful act. No, he uses a term that throughout the New Testament means a settled pathway in life. He's speaking here of a person's walk. It is to sin habitually. It's a a continual practice of setting one's face against the will and the purposes of God. And if that is the pathway of life you have chosen, then there is no possibility of you having fellowship with God. You're in darkness, and he's enlightened, ne'er the twain shall meet. The Catechism, let me remind you, says God is infinite, eternal, and unchanging in his holiness. Perhaps you know that old story of a policeman who sees a drunk man crawling around on his hands and knees below a lamppost. And the policeman stops and asks and says, what are you looking for? And the, the, the drunk replies, I've lost my keys. So the policeman decides to help him and after another five minutes of fruitless effort, he gives up and asks, well, where did you drop your keys? And the drunk man points across the road to the other side of the street and says, I lost them over there. Bewildered, the policeman asks, well then, if you lost them over there, why on earth are you looking for them here? To which the reply comes, because the light's better over here. Sorry about that. John is explaining that there are two sides of the street. One is well lit, one is bright, and the other is in darkness. And you can only walk on one side of the street or the other. You cannot compromise or you'll get run over by a bus. And as we will see shortly, he's not talking about sinless perfection here. But this does mean living with an intentional pursuit of holiness. His call is for people to choose, in the words of of Van Morrison, the bright side of the road. To claim to have fellowship with God and yet to persist in living in sin is nonsensical. Or as David Jackman puts it, you might as well live in a coal pit and tell people you're developing a suntan. Now it's interesting to note how many people decide that they no longer believe in God at around the same time as as choosing to engage in particular sins. For example, young people will go to university. They'll leave the shelter of their parents' home. They will have cut off restraints. And now the bright light of the big city will afford them opportunities to sin that they'd never even thought of before. Consequently, they say that their belief in God has been jettisoned in order to make their practice of sin more comfortable to their conscience. They desire to walk in darkness and so their fellowship with God must end. Let's press on to verse 7. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Let me divide the the teaching of this verse into three sections, each beginning with F. Faithfulness, fellowship, and forgiveness. First, faithfulness. The God who is light expects his children should live consistently in the light. It's not enough for people to appeal to some decision that they made 20 years before and still call themselves Christians, even though their conduct clearly contradicts such a claim. Rather, there ought to be daily, even hourly, the experience of sanctification. That the nearer I draw toward the one who is light, the more clearly I become aware of my sinfulness. The dark corners that I might otherwise uh, allow uh, secret sins to persist in are uh, enlightened as as God's searchlight sweeps around, exposing and examining all that is not as it ought to be. The Gnostics, the Docetists, claimed that what they did with their bodies had no relevance to their relationship with God. But John will not have it. If you persist willfully to live in sin and still claim to share fellowship with God, Quite simply and categorically, you are a liar. There must be 
faithfulness in your living. And this leads to fellowship. We find John's quite incredible conclusion. He says, walking in the light leads, not as you would assume to having fellowship with God, but to living in fellowship with one another. And again, here's another shot across the bows of the Gnostics, who, because of a sense of superiority, had separated themselves off from the rest of the church. But John is saying that when our relationships on the vertical plane are as they ought to be, when we rightly relate to God, that necessarily impacts our relationships on the horizontal plane. A right relationship with God necessarily leads to right relationships among the body of Christ, the church. We rightly relate to other believers. And this is so essential for our spiritual well-being. I often use, and I'll use it again, that little quote from Eugene Peterson in his book, Five Smooth Stones for Pastoral Work. And there he writes, There are no Robinson Crusoe traditions in the biblical narratives. You could be damned by yourself, but you could not be saved by yourself. Think back to the Garden of Eden. There, having tasted of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, the immediate consequence for Adam and Eve was that they no longer felt comfortable in each other's presence. They had sinned and and now there was something for them to hide, which they failed miserably to do as they chose to use the ineffective technique of sewing fig leaves together. But their wardrobe failure was an outward manifestation of a heart problem. It was the outward evidence that they were no longer inwardly rightly relating to God. And for John, If there is a religious teaching that causes division in the body of Christ, that leads to the promotion of a a religious elite, it is not of God, it belongs to the darkness. To not actively and effectively pursue and develop meaningful relationships with other believers is sin. Faithfulness, which leads to fellowship, experience because of forgiveness. Now note that John does not say forgiveness here. He says, the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us. Katharizu in Greek. It's the removal of a defilement so that it no longer has an impact upon us. It is a continuous action. The blood of Jesus Christ keeps on cleansing us. Of course, there's a question here. That if we're walking in the light... Why then is there the need for that continual cleansing of the blood of Jesus Christ? Now, this is not a green light to pursue and regularly engage in sin. Rather, it's an acknowledgement of a lifelong struggle that we will have with our flesh. So that when we inevitably and regrettably sin, there is still an answer to our need. We will, God willing, think more about this in the weeks that are to come. Just in passing, what about those who find themselves continually having to come before God to confess a particular sin? Those who feel unable to break free from the power of persistent sin, be it bad-tempered outbursts, a a, a need to gossip, or a, a longing to view pornography. Well, there are, there are two things to consider. Firstly, if someone is struggling with persistent sin, there should be evidence of a struggle. And if that individual willfully commits the same sin over and over again without any sense of remorse, without showing any evidence of a genuine desire to change, then you have reason to doubt the sincerity of their faith. But if that's not the case, If there is grief and broken heartedness over a failure to conquer sin, the very fact that he or she is wrestling with doubts and fears about their standing before God ought to convince us that this person is not guilty of rejecting Christ. If they were, this continuously committed sin would give them not a a cause for concern. So you're either struggling with sin 
or you've surrendered to it. You can never come before God too often in penitent prayer. If God's people live together in Christian community, if our fellowship is to be close and loving, it's going to require a great deal of repentance and forgiveness being regularly displayed among us. And as those who are recipients of mercy, needy sinners, God's children must ever be quick to dispense such mercy and forgiveness toward others. Faithfulness, fellowship, forgiveness. Let me spend uh, just a few moments as we close thinking about two of these issues uh, for our application. Breaking fellowship and being forgiven. Firstly, breaking fellowship. Many years ago, having recently arrived in the locality, I was urged to visit with a brother and sister who lived in a beautiful home just outside the little village of Ardstraw. The brother was seriously ill and indeed died shortly afterwards and it was deemed that, although I didn't understand why this might be, that he needed to be given a good Presbyterian funeral. And the reason for this, I very quickly discovered, was that his sister was a Cuneate. I'll not take time to explain what that is. You can Google it. And in the days after the funeral, I I returned to the family home to visit with the grieving sister. And we spent a very pleasant time together. And as I was preparing to leave, I offered, as I naturally would on a pastoral call, to pray with her. And I said, can I pray with you? And she said, no. She went on to explain, when you have the true light, then you'll be able to pray with me, but not until then. Rather flummoxed by this, I I, I beat a hasty retreat. And this is the challenge of this text. And what we need to carefully consider how we apply it. Now, there's clearly a requirement for God's people to keep themselves separate from the world. But when does it come acceptable for us to separate ourselves from others who clearly profess faith in Jesus Christ? Again, I think of a funeral service I conducted when there was a young man, a candidate for the ministry in another denomination, who carried his grandmother's coffin right up to the very door of the church building. And there on the threshold, he stepped aside and refused to enter. He had decided that he would separate himself from Presbyterians. Or in this week of General Assembly, I think of decisions that have been made over recent assemblies to withdraw a fellowship from our mother church, the Church of Scotland, and to no longer send or receive representatives from that denomination. These were decisions to which I added my support because I believe them to be right. But They are incredibly dangerous decisions to make. And it is ever possible for us to become overly confident of our understanding of Christian truth. And we need constantly to ask the Spirit of God to apply the Word of God to our lives to ensure that we are not becoming prideful, arrogant or ungracious. You know those words in Proverbs 16 and verse 18, which say pride goes before destruction, and a haughty spirit before a fall. And it's a very tiny step from believing that what you're doing is right to being convinced that you really can't do any wrong. And we need to be constantly praying that God would create within us humble hearts. Now, when we speak of harmony within the fellowship of God's people, You must not assume that this means we're always going to agree on everything. How dull would that be if we all thought exactly alike on every issue? No, true fellowship exists when when people can disagree agreeably because God has forged among us deep bonds of love and he has equipped us to see the worth and value that he has placed upon each individual and to appreciate the blessing that we can receive and the help that is to be found as we live together and learn from one another. Breaking fellowship and being forgiven. We live in a world that is attempting to exclude sin 
from our social conscience. And there's nothing that sin loves more than for people to be blind to its presence. Sin has been redefined. We, we speak of people being broken and, uh, and life has caused flaws in their lives which excuses the choices that they make. There, there's no sense of moral guilt or accountability to a holy God. Even to speak into our modern society about the reality of sin is, is claimed to, to be self-righteous arrogance. Tim Keller comments, when others hear a Christian call something sin, they believe that you're saying, these are bad people and I am good. These are people who should be shunned, excluded, and I should be welcomed. These are people whom God condemns because of this behavior. But I'm accepted by God because I don't do that. Sin is serious. We must declare its reality before the world. The Westminster Confession, chapter 6, says this, that every sin, both original and actual, being a transgression of the righteous law of God and contrary thereunto, doth in its own nature bring guilt upon the sinner, whereby he is bound over to the wrath of God and the curse of the law, and so made subject to death with all miseries, spiritual, temporal, and eternal. Sin is serious. And if the precious blood of the sinless Son of God was the only means whereby our sins could be forgiven, then sin is a subject that we must take with deadly seriousness. So we respect that, that sin is serious. But we must rejoice in a greater truth that salvation in Christ is secure. That if God gave his son to save us, if Jesus' blood was shed to cleanse us, if God is a God who is light and is determined to bring his people into the light, his commitment to this glorious task is confirmed at Calvary and, and, and gospel hope then must flood into our hearts. Sin is serious, but in Christ our salvation is secure. And this we rejoice in, and this we make known to the world, that they too might know their sins cleansed, their fellowship with God renewed, their pathway a path that leads them ever into the light. Let's pray together. Father, we do thank you for the truth of your word, that you are the God who is light. There's no darkness in you at all. And as we gaze upon you and as we look for a, a tentative moment at our own hearts, we know there's deep darkness within us. Continue to cleanse us by the blood of Jesus Christ. Continue to shine the light of your word and your truth deep within that evermore we would uproot those seeds of sin that have found a place within. Lord, may we know that touch that makes us new, that perfects us and shapes the likeness of Christ within us. Lord, send your Holy Spirit. Bring your word of truth to bear upon us. And we, we rejoice to know that for all the sinfulness that, that we have done in the past and we will yet commit in the future, because of Jesus, because the blood of Jesus Christ continues to cleanse us, our salvation in him is secure. May that deep assurance comfort and care for us and help us to reach out and love toward others, that they too might come to know and live with the God who is light. Through the name of Jesus Christ, we pray these things. Amen.